Early spring. Late March, Denmark. Forest. Worthy. Honorable. And perfectly self-enlightened. Worshipless Buddha. Consummated in knowledge and behavior. Totally transcended. Expert in all dimensions. Noah of all worlds. Unsurpassable trainer of those who can be tamed. Both teacher and guide of gods as well as of humans. Blessed. Exalted. Awakened. And perfectly self-enlightened. Was a blessed Buddha. Perfectly formulated is this Buddha Dhamma, visible right here and now, immediately effective, timeless, inviting each and every one to come and see for themselves, inspect, examine, and verify, leading each and everyone through progress towards perfection. Directly observable, experienceable and realizable by each intelligence. Perfectly training is this noble Sangha community of the Buddhist noble disciples. They are training the right way, the true way, the good way, the direct way. Therefore do these eight kind of individuals, these four noble pairs, deserve both gifts, self-sacrifice, Offerings, hospitality, and reverence of salutation, the joint palms. Since this noble Sangha community of the Buddhist noble disciples is an unsurpassable and in indeed forever unsurpassed field of merit in this world, for this world, to honor, respect, support, uphold, and protect. Thank you. Buddhism has not so much to do with flowers and incense sticks and all these uh, ritualist and Buddha statues which we usually familiar uh, get to in touch with. There's a, a, a philosophy behind it and a practice behind it that has relevance for all beings, all sentient beings, all conscious beings. Because why? They have basically the same problem. They're going to die. They're impermanent and they can suffer. So all beings who can suffer they have this uh, problem that suffering is threatening from behind, knocking the door in the form of death, but also, in, as you know, you are uh, concerned, you're giving, uh, trying to solve problems in the working place in many other cases. Huh? And there Buddhism actually has a toolbox, you can say, for many of these uh, completely general, universal problems for all sentient beings. Uh, Buddha, he was born, the last Buddha, which is the fourth, he was born 563 four before Christ and died 483 before Christ. So he, he became 80 years old. He became enlightened. He went forth from home when he was 26. He just got a son named Rahula. And then he became enlightened six years after. Then he spoke for 44 years. And this means that uh, uh, the text, what he said and what we follow and what we have to study is uh, this size. So it's two meter and ten. So it's a double of a medicine uh, study, which I took in my youth. So uh, I have no chance of summarize 
56 books. Huh? So I can give some kind of brush up with a very broad brush of the philosophy and the practice, and then we can try some, some meditation. But it cannot be anything other than a taster. Uh, so I just want to warn about that. Uh, the plan is, I would say, uh, 15 minutes about uh, Buddha Siddhartha Gautama's last Buddha's life, and then 15 minutes about his uh, philosophy and the discipline, and then 15 minutes will take, a, if I keep the time, on the 40 classical meditation objects. He was born, as, a, as I said, in uh, 463. He was son of a, a king called Suddhodana, and, and uh, he was born up in a small kingdom which was not more the size of uh, this island, Sealand. So a relatively small uh, kingdom. His, his mother king was a queen, Mahamaya, and her little sister, Gotama, was both born or married to the same king called Suddhodana. And if we take uh, the Buddhist life, then actually we have 547 reincarnation stories before he was born. You are looking this way, yeah, so it's from this side, huh? But I will take Buddha's life from Reckon from what happened immediately before he was conceived and went into his mother's womb, and then what happened immediately after his death as an 80-year-old, and then summarize that as, as good as I can in 15 minutes. Huh? So he is, as everybody else uh, who become a Buddha, which we call a Bodhisattva or Bodhisattva, means a being who is going to be Buddha, uh, they are at that pom uh, point in their career, they are 50% enlightened. So enlightenment is not body to wake up to reality. It's not a sudden process where you get a complete enlightenment. It's a stepwise process where there can be actually many lives to take one more step. So first is 25% enlightenment. This we call a sotapanna, one who has gone into the stream. It means in practice that you only have seven lives left before attaining body, before attaining enlightenment. Next step up is a sakadagami. He has, he, it basically means you return once to this world. And this is uh, all the bodhisattvas, when they go to this uh, particular place, which is called the contented dimension, then they are all sakadagamis. This means that they have one more left, one more life left on earth. But it doesn't say anything that they have some uh, other lives in div divine dimensions, but they have one more turn here. And this usually means that they come back here, then they finish the job. So next step, this, so this means that they are 50% enlightened. Next step is an anagami. It means uh, they are very good meditators. They go to a fairly high level, which I will cover, the Buddhist cosmology and some a little later down the road. And there they, they do not come back. So we say they are never returners, never returners. And the last stage is called arahant, and basically means a worthy one. Worthy of what? Worthy of Anjali, that you uh, respect him or her with uh, this gesture. Worthy of gifts from the lay people. Uh, and worthy of being uh, living a free life uh, in the forest with having no obligations uh, neither to the lay people or society or any boss. So this is uh, basically uh, his life story. He's then uh, a lot of uh, devas, uh, which means shining ones, and we are also shining to some extent. We are all bodies who are who have a temperature be beyond absolute zero, they are emitting light, uh, black body radiation in, in our case. is not visible, but it's infrared light, and they are also emitting light to a large, larger extent. And they come uh, from uh, various other levels and request him, there are more than 10,000, who request him to go down and become a Buddha. And then he looks and see whether his mother is all right, his father is all right, his castle is all right, and whether the time is right. That is basically, he will judge, evaluate how long human life is. If it's less than 100 years, for example, as it is now, then they will not come. If it's more than 10,000 years, then they will not come either, because then people forget that they are dying. Then you cannot tell the message. If they are shorter than 100 years, then they are too stupid, because they cannot remember. Sinal uh, Anyway, so uh, they request him, and he agrees uh, to go, and then he more or less evaporate or die, or you can see pass out of existence uh, the very same day. The same day, uh, Queen Mahamaya have a dream uh, that he's conceived. She dreams that uh, she's being lifted up on a golden net by four shining beings and transported to a cave where she falls asleep. And uh, so she have a dream in a dream, more or less. In this second dream, she dreams that a white elephant with a lotus flower in its, uh, in its trunk enters her right side. And this is also general for all uh, Buddhist mothers, you can say. Nevertheless, um, 
his, uh, then conceives, she carries her, uh, him in 10 months. It's said that she, she can see the, the fetus, she can see him, him as a baby inside her own womb. So uh, the womb uh, is some kind of transparent, probably only for her. He's sitting up, he has, he's sitting with his, uh, his back to her back uh, and looking straight out, sitting meditating. She then carries him for 10 months. When she is going to give birth, she goes to her parents. This is uh, usually the case also now on Sri Lanka. In the last uh, month, they will go home to their parents from, from the house, usually living with the husband. And then on the way, uh, she uh, says to her waiters that she, they have to stop and uh, she will have to have a small rest in a park called Lumbini. And there uh, she goes in to take a, a nap and they put some baldakins around her and then she c goes into birth and give, then gives birth to the Buddha standing up uh, holding a branch uh, of a small forest. This Lumbini Park still exists uh, today. And there's a, there's a small Maya Devi, there's a small figure of her, and also a small temple. Then uh, they come back to where King Sududana is, and uh, he, of course, as they did at that time, they call a lot of soothsayers, Hindu soothsayers, to see what's uh, the child's future. And then this old man who comes, who's very experienced, the guy, he, he see the marks, there's a, 32 major marks on a Buddha and 80 minor marks, so he recognizes this is, going, is a Buddha to be. Uh, and then he starts crying. Then they ask, why are you crying? Because they are afraid that this will be a bad future. But nevertheless, he says that this is as good as it can be. He's, he's a perfect child. And uh, he cries because he will not see him become a Buddha. So he's very saddened about that. He will die, he can see also that he will die before uh, this young man enlightens. Then the king, uh, Sudadana, who is interested in his son becoming a king after himself, he called in 20 other soothsayers mm -hmm. to get another prediction. Mm -hmm. And uh, they all, uh, 19 of them, hold up two fingers. Uh, one finger says, they say, either he can be a Buddha or he can be a universal monarch. And universal monarch is kind of an emperor over uh, the entire India. And this, of course, uh, Sudadana, he was very interested in that, so his son. So he asked, how can I how can I get uh, him out of his uh, Buddha destiny? Uh, and they say then uh, he should not see any kind of suffering. So they, may, they make t three castles to him where he's only surrounded by uh, female musicians. There's no men, there's no, uh, there's no elderly people, there's no kind of suffering. So he has an extreme uh, luxurious uh, upbringing, you can say. He's then married to his wife, which uh, in the text, uh, being mentioned as his wife 31 times. This is typical uh, from, and you can also see from your own uh, spouses that uh, typically you'll have to have the same spouse uh, 50 times, 100 times, it's like that. So Yasodara, as uh, her name is, she said that her skin is golden. Uh, she's 16 years old when she's married to him. He wins her in a bow an arrow contest uh, with other nobles at that time, uh, which I think is was common at that time. And um, she uh, becomes quick, uh, pregnant fairly quickly and gives birth to a son called Rahula, which means obstruction. Before uh, she uh, gives birth, uh, it is said that the, the devas say, ah, now it's, it's time for him to leave the house, go, to go forth into homelessness which I also have done. I also left the son. I asked him first, though, uh, if I could leave. Then he said I could leave in three years when he was seven. Uh, but it's hard to leave your son. And it also was for the Buddha. It's not because he, he doesn't love his son, nor is it because he doesn't love his wife, nor is it because he finds it unpleasant to stay in his castle. It's because he's very determined about uh, clearing this problem of suffering, which he has seen because he, Devas make some, uh, uh, you can say, game uh, experience with him. They take him out of the castle in a wagon, which is, was not allowed for him to go for his father, and then show him four signs. They show him an old man, a sick man, and a dead man. Then he asks his driver, what is that, what is that? And then they say, this is an old man. Then he asks, do I also become old? Yes, you also become old. And then they say, how treacherous this samsara is. I thought I was permanent. I thought was, I was everlasting. My youth was everlasting. And this you can think about your own youth uh, yeah. and uh, physical beauty. Huh? One of my friends, uh, which actually is present, he uh, once told me, or recently told me, that until he was 17 years old, he didn't regard death as a problem for him. He acknowledged that uh, death was a reality, but just not for him. 
<laughs> Until they were 17, this we call intoxication with youth, that you are so intoxicated with this bliss of youth, of being a youngster, of going around partying, sex, drugs, and rock and roll. So you cannot imagine yourself being a, a senile, dementia, drooling fool who is uh, smelling ill. Huh? Nevertheless, that's of course the facts for all of us. So this, he realizes that, uh, and then he sees one more thing. They show him one more thing. They show him a monk, a Buddhist monk, who, who is very serene, who is very calm, and who also ex uh, exudes some kind of bliss that is uh, kind of like the Mona Lisa smile. You don't know why they're happy, but you can see that they're happy, because you just don't know why. So he goes back into his castle, uh, and then they go up in his stairs and decide the very same day to leave the house. And on the way out, he, he opens the door and looks into Yasodara, which lies there on the bed and sleeping with uh, Rahula, uh, born the same day, all born in, within seven days. There's some agreement about the timing. And it decides not to wake them up, because then they will probably be able to hold him back. But nevertheless, uh, so he don't wake them up. He leaves uh, on his horse, Kantaka, and then uh, his driver holds uh, the tail of Kantaka, uh, and uh, they in the middle of the night, middle of the night, he crosses two rivers and then decides to step down from the, from the horse. He takes off all his jewelry uh, and clothes, uh, regalia that you, that you have as a young prince. And then he cuts off his hair, so they have kind of like a Rastafari hair that is knotted up in some very strange, knotted, very strange uh, looking uh, hair, hair mold. But nevertheless, he unfolds away all of it and cuts his off with his sword. And then uh, he, he walks into the forest and says to Kantaka and uh, his driver that they should go back to the castle. Kantaka uh, dies from sorrow. Uh, poor, poor horse. Nevertheless, uh, he, the driver goes back and tells a story about the, the young prince which have left the, left the house and that he cannot come back. And he's later ordained also. Uh, Buddha then uh, seeks, what should I do? How do I become enlightened? So he seeks two teachers. Two teachers at that time in India, there's a, a humongous amount of gurus. Uh, so he, teach, uh, he, he seeks up the two best of them to, to learn meditation. He learns meditation of them to a fairly high level, actually, uh, but decides that this is not the end of suffering and then leaves them uh, afterwards. So uh, he afterwards uh, he has left there. He's without. Then he meets some friends, and then they decide to starve themselves to to enlightenment. So kind of self torture. You also see in India today, people who think that you can gain enlightenment with holding your arm up, sh uh, or have all kinds of strains, uh, burning yourself close to fires, uh, lying uh, curled up on a, on the ground as a dog, barking as a dog or as a cow, or many kinds of uh, very weird things to do which of course is, is useless. But nevertheless, uh, he, he starves himself for six years, and uh, to the extent that he's almost dying, he has black necrosis on his skin, you know, from mummification, the, the, the skin will be black, or from, you get a frost, frosty finger, then the finger falls off, become completely black. This he has over his entire skin. When he, he does like this, then the whole falls off. When he touches his belly, then he's, he can feel the, the columna, the, what is that called? Spine, spine. Yeah? He can feel the spine. When he urinates or defecates, then he, he faints because his blood pressure is so low. So he's very, very close, very, very close to dying. He says to himself, is there anybody in whole India who starves himself more than I? And then he realizes this is not the case. So since uh, he assumes that there are enlightened beings, then he says, ah, then uh, starvation and this tapas, this self-torture cannot be the way. And then he say, I have to moderate, I have to eat so I can give the... The, the get a little strength in the body, and uh, by doing that, uh, these five friends that he had met with, and that also were starving themselves, they leave him in contempt, because now he's kind of like uh, giving up, they say he's giving up his, pra uh, his practice, huh? so they, they leave him in contempt, and then he go on for himself, uh, he meditates for some period, we don't know how long, but the whole process from he goes forth to his attaining enlightenment takes six years. Why does it take six years for the next Buddha, Buddha Mitzaya, which is called the friendly one, or Ajita Mitzaya, the unconquerable friend? Uh, this will only take seven days, which is the minimum. So the saying goes like this, just an example of the karmic law. Under the last Buddha, they were called, before we had Siddhartha Kutama, this is the fourth one in this uh, universe, 
Then there was one called Kasapa, then Kakusanta, then Kunaganama. And then Mitea will come in 506, 76 million years. So he had been a pupil under 24 other Buddhists down the road. Uh, here we are in 91 universal cycles back in history. So uh, Kasapa Buddha, when he met him, he was a young uh, priest son, a young Brahmin son who could uh, recite the Vedas uh, perfectly. He was, you can say, kind of like an upper class academic, uh, very proud of himself, also very arrogant uh, fellow, uh, high class, maybe even a playboy, uh, if you could have that in India. And then he had a friend, a low caste friend uh, called Gatikara, which uh, means uh, the pot maker, and they were out bathing in the Ganges River. And uh, the low caste people, they're not allowed to touch uh, the high caste people. Huh? So, uh, but nevertheless, they were friends. And then Gatikara says to him, they, uh, they're out bathing there, uh, that they should go up and see Buddha Kasapa because he sits up in a forest. And then uh, this uh, young, uh, very proud of himself fellow says, uh, no, 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 I won't speak to such a baldling, such a shaven one, huh? mm -hmm. in, uh, in Danish, in Skalipan. Mm -hmm. uh, so very uh, derogative uh, word, because he had contempt. He was a Hindu at that time, huh? so he had a lot of contempt to other religious uh, traditions. And since he also, he had a long, long hair, uh, they are not allowed to cut their hair like six. So he was very proud of his hair and social status and so on, so he showed very much contempt. And then Gatikara asked him one more time, it's good to see the Buddhist, you have to go up and see him. And then he says, again, uh, I won't see this baldling, this uh, scalapene. And so, uh, but uh, Gatikara, he's uh, an insisting fellow. He then uh, grabs him by the hair knots and then pulls him under the water and keeps him under the water until he's almost drowning. And then this <gasps> comes up there, <gasps> okay, I'll go. So, so he's kind of like shocked, one, that he will touch him. He's not allowed to touch him. And secondly, that he's almost going to the extent of drowning him. So he, he understands by this insisting that he has to go. And then he goes there, and this, uh, you can say, is, uh, uh, shows something about, he, he has been a Buddhist, he has ha undergone Buddhist training under 24 other Buddhists, but he has forgotten all about it. Uh, but he only needs to talk for very few minutes with this uh, Buddha Kasapa, then he decides on the spot to ordain, he never goes back to his father's house, to his high class uh, Brahmin caste. So he ordains on the very spot. And this is a, 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 an indication of prior training. When I look at you, uh, then uh, just the fact that you are here, that you actually have come here, is also an indication uh, that you have been in prior training or you have been in contact with Buddhism before and you have some remote interest about it. You cannot remember why you have a remote interest about it, but you probably have had contact with it. Uh, so that's why you are here, I can say, and this uh, uh, makes me happy because you, you then, just by that fact alone, have a better prognosis in general than other can. And, but it's just to say, uh, this is one I cannot remember anything. It's not a, a, a fact that it has not happened. For example, you can ask yourself your, sir, this question, can I remember what I got to dinner last, the same day as this one last week? Or the same day as your birthday when you were 10 years old, 20 years old, 30 years old? You, cannot, you have no idea, huh? no idea. So if you have no idea about remembrance of uh, significant events in this life, how should you have any idea about significant events in a former life? Huh? So no remembrance is not the same as no existence. Nevertheless, um, he um, then goes around there out in the jungle, meditates for himself, meet a man who has some hay, he gets uh, hay from him, and then sits down on a tree, a lady comes, uh, a very nice lady who has made some rice, porridge, milk rice, risengrød in Danish, uh, and wants to offer it f to a tree god in order to get uh, she will be married, wish she will be married with one from her same caste, same social class, and her firstborn will be a son. And this actually happens. Then she meets the Buddha and mistakes him for this, uh, this tree god and offers uh, on a golden uh, plate this, uh, this milk rice, which he then uh, rolls up in 49 balls, uh, take a bath, and then eat the 49 balls, and then don't eat for anything for seven weeks after the enlightenment. The same day that she comes, he, he had some special dreams uh, at night, which goes for all uh, Buddhas actually. He dreams that, uh, which is a sign to him that now it's gonna happen, now it's very imminent. He dreams, for example, that he's lying in India with, uh, with 
as a, as a huge, gigantic giant with his uh, using the Himalayas as a pillow and with his legs in the Indian Ocean down at Sri Lanka. So he's covering, he's using whole India as a bed, as a symbolic representation that he will awaken to unexcelled, unsurpassable, perfect enlightenment. Uh, then he dreams that there will grow a creeper up out his navel and it will wind up all into the, into the sky as a symbolic representation that he will set forth the noble eightfold way, which is the way to enlightenment and also the way to uh, higher existence. He dreams that four uh, different uh, birds come flying from the four corners and then they land in his, in his, on his legs and they become, turn all white as a symbolic representation that he will enlighten all four castes that forecast in India mm -hmm. and all four disciples they will, uh, he will make pure and then enlightened. Uh, the four kinds of disciples are monks and nuns and female and male uh, lay disciples. Huh? Then he dreams uh, that he walks around on a, no, he dreams that some worms come, small white worms with a black head, they come from all sides and crawl up to his uh, legs as a symbolic representation that he would have a, a huge, humongous amount of lay followers. The lay, uh, the lay Buddhist, uh, you can say, clothing is completely white, which is uh, very nice. I also wear it for some years because you have to be very mindful or aware or have clear comprehension of what you're doing in order not to spoil this white clothes. Huh? It, get, mm -hmm. it, 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 it quickly get dirty. So it's a kind of training to wear this all white. Yeah, yes, it's true, it's true. Uh, so he dreams lastly that he, he, will, he walks around on a huge humongous mountain of excrement without getting soiled as a symbolic representation that he will get a lot of gifts, uh, very expensive gifts, a whole, uh, whole monasteries and so on, without being attached to them. He will never cling to them. So he says, ah, uh, waking up from this dream, surely today I will enlighten. Another sign is he's, he takes this golden dish that the lady leaves without uh, having any thought about it, and then he eats this, uh, this uh, 49 balls of uh, rice porridge, and then he puts it in, in the water, and then uh, it goes upstream. So says, if it goes upstream, then surely I will be enlightened. Then it goes upstream. And then it's said that uh, it go, he follows it like, kind of like, like 10, 15 meters, and then there's, there's some undulation in the water and then it goes, it goes down and then it's set to land exactly at the same spot where the four other Buddhist uh, plates are underground. Huh? Um, so uh, he enlightens at the night uh, and remembers a humongous amount of his former lives. Uh, they say 400 eons and 100,000 uh, kalpas, so it's a, it's a many universal cycles. His wife Yasudara also is uh, appointed foremost in this ability to remember former lives. She remember uh, one Asankaya and 100,000 universal cycles. One Asankaya, uh, he said, is if you take a box that is eight times eight times eight kilometers, and then put in sesame seed, then every sesame seed uh, symbolizes one universal cycle, which is from Big Bang to the next Big Bang. Or, yeah, from Big Bang to Big Crunch, and then to the next Big Bang. And this is approximately 150 billion years. So it's a humongous amount of uh, lives. He explains that he remembers them like this. You see that uh, you are like this and that kind, this and that species. Then uh, you do this and that, you have this and that pleasures, you have this and that social position. And then you have uh, this and that, uh, you eat this and that and then you die from this and that disease. Then you see like a man going in one house, then he goes out this house and go in another house. Then you see his next life, ah, I was reborn there, then I had this and that, uh, this and that species, I was this and that kind. It's worth mentioning that the 547 life stories we have from this universal cycle of the Buddha himself, he in numerous times are animals. He are monkeys, uh, deers, uh, pheasants, uh, snakes, uh, yes, is what I can remember. But many of many of the stories that he says, uh, with emphasis, it is only from this universal cycle. He's an animal, uh, and this is is worth no noticing. Then he uh, enlightens there and decides uh, the next morning to go out and proclaim. But uh, is in doubt whether there are any humans left on the planet Earth that would be understand that be able to understand his message. 
Uh, and then a uh, uh, deva comes and requests him, uh, Brahma deva comes and requests him to, to, uh, to proclaim the Dhamma, and this he then does. He then looks around and see who, who, can, who can understand, and then he eyes scans and eyes his old two teachers, but they are dead. So he goes back to his, these five, uh, five fellows that has rejected him. Uh, uh, they are in a park some hundred kilometers from there. And uh, on the road he meets two uh, Burmese traders that comes and see he has, he sits under this, uh, out in the forest, and then he has kind of like a ray, it's, this is said to be around a fathom, it's two meters around him, where there's some light, this can, they can see. And then they wash their face, their hand, their mouth and their feet and go and uh, speak to him and also get a souvenir, six hairs, which are now placed in the Svidagon uh, pagoda, the golden pagoda. I don't know if you would know, very beautiful uh, one. It's said to have one inch of gold uh, in the Myanmar, in Rangoon, Myanmar. Uh, Obama was there with the CIA. They all were, had to take off their shoes. It was very <laughs> nice to see. Um, then uh, he lives this uh, 45 years and uh, get a homunculus among the monks. And then in the age of 80, he relinquishes the last 20 years he can live. He could live to until he was 100, but relinquishes them uh, deliberately uh, because he's not requested to stay. And so he uh, uh, also deliberately eats some uh, pork, which I think is a subtle statement about uh, to be vegetarian. He eats some infected pork that he knows is infected. Uh, as far as we know, I think it's uh, close to Mørbra with champion that has uh, not been uh, has been standing and become half rotten. So he get dysentery, very severe diarrhea. But as an 80 year old man, uh, carry on for more than more than 30 kilometers, uh, drinks water, has a lot of uh, of uh, excrement along the road, uh, but still then comes to a small place called Cusinara where he lies down between two sal trees, which are then raining flowers and sprigs on him. And then uh, late in night, after having numerous meetings with a lot of people, uh, he goes into Pari Nibbana. Pari Nibbana means the final Nibbana. So there's kind of like two Nibbanas. Uh, nibbana is the same word as Nirvana. So this is just Sanskrit and Pali. So if you say Kama, uh, so is Sanskrit. If you say Kama, then it's Pali. Bauda is Sanskrit. Well, Buddha is, uh, is Pali. So they're very close to each other. Indo-European language is not spoken anymore. This is basically wh what I read. Maybe we should let this go around. You can try a funny trick with yourself. Uh, just uh, open on a ram random page and then uh, read five lines. See what, see what it says. Mm -hmm. Maybe this is a message to you. <laughs> yes. <laughs> no, uh, the Dhamma has this, you will see for yourself when you start. It has this funny, uh, uh, very strange, uh, also almost mysterious, if you need some aspect or you have some a special problem or something like that, then suddenly you will get this kind of key or understanding or whatever that was particularly, you feel as this kind of like almost uncanny that uh, how can it be? It's some correlations uh, between, but it's definitely not random. Then I think we take some little practice which I forgot. Can you do like this? So you do fingers up like this, and then like this, this and then you place this one in this angle here, and then elbow close. So this is Anjali. If you want to emphasize, is make it better than this one, then you take up on the head, yeah, keep close. If you want to talk to somebody, uh, while, for example, now <laughs> you have to talk, you can see this is a little uncomfortable, then you take it down in front of the heart, and then it's good if this line is straight. Straight. Then you can also feel your bones huh? and tendons. Then you just repeat after me. Namo. Namo. Tasso. Tasso. Bhagavatto. Bhagavatto. Arahatto. Arahatto. Samma Sambuddhasa. Samma Sambuddhasa. In English. Worthy. Worthy. Honorable. Honorable. And perfectly. And perfectly. Self enlightened. Self enlightened. Was the blessed Buddha. Was the blessed Buddha. In Danish, a verdi. A verdi. Full standing complete. Full standing complete. All perfect. All perfect. Sell oblivious. Sell oblivious. Vatnvelsinet Buddha. 
Var det velsignet, det bøtter? Okay, så skal vi teste. Hånd på hjertet. Hvor mange synes, at de har gjort noget forkert nu? Ikke nu. Hvor mange synes, de har gjort noget rigtigt nu? Ja. Det er svært. <laughs> Hvor mange synes, de har gjort både noget rigtigt og noget forkert? Ja, ja. Hvor mange synes, de har gjort hverken noget rigtigt eller forkert? Ja. Det var mange. Hverken noget rigtigt, noget neutralt? Ja, okay. Jeg tror faktisk, at vi er kommet igennem Buddhas liv, hva? Han døde i hvert fald. Jo, jeg skal lige sige, at øh, tre måneder efter, at han døde, så bliver der... Okay. Eller, ja, sorry. No, no. Six months after he died, his, he was burned in a special kind of iron, big iron uh, pot, you can say. They wounded him up in, in uh, as they should do, uh, he said that himself. They winded him up in gaze and uh, cotton uh, seven times and then burned him. And then there was some, uh, in this side, this such big uh, iron thing, Uh, they poured it out, then they divided the relics in eight portions. And then uh, this teeth and this collarbone and this collarbone, some splinters of it is still in Sri Lanka. And then there's these hairs, some hairs also which was collected before, and then there's various other portions of, uh, of uh, relics uh, in various other countries. But the uh, three uh, genuine relics is on Sri Lanka. Is there questions to his uh, biography? No. Okay, then I will go a little uh, into detail with what he actually said, as, as far as I can. Um, what he, he, we have these uh, three things that we worship, or we take refuge in, or we seek protection in. This is the first the Buddha himself. It's not like we take refuge in a particular person, because there's been other Buddhas before him, they say the same. And there will come other Buddhas after him, they say all the same. So it's more like taking refuge in an institution, Uh, that has different persons, but more or less all they say the same. They say the same. So the skeleton of the Dhamma, what they proclaim, and Dhamma means a thing that can carry itself. Dharana, it can carry itself. Uh, it also means state. It also means phenomenon. But in, the, in this sense, it means something that carry on and can carry itself. Uh, it goes, they have a very nice saying in Sri Lanka that it goes in three, if you should explain the Dhamma in In very short uh, sentences, they say sila samadhi panya. Sila means morality, and the morality basically means that you take five precepts. We say it's five training rules. It's not that you promise anything. You just say, "I will accept to take up this training rule to trade towards uh, this uh, particular moral rule." The moral rule is one. Uh, I accept the training rule of avoidance all killing. Two. I accept the training rules of avoiding all stealing. Three, I accept the training rule of avoiding all sexual abuse. Four, I accept the training rule of uh, not lying, not speaking false. Five, I accept the training rule of not uh, taking intoxicants and drinking alcohol. And usually in a Western setting, the number five is a problem. <laughs> <laughs> What about my wine, my beers, and all this? Well, so is it. Uh, so this is uh, before you can say you cannot get any protection as much as you like. You can you can pray to a Buddhist statue and burn incense sticks and so on. If uh, if you go and kill somebody and steal and lie and so on, you will not have a good result with any kind of training, and you not have a good future in any kind of service because there's a karmic response. Basically, if I should say very briefly what the karmic law is, then it's a probabilistic mirror. So. Uh, Uh, mind sends out radiation in much the same sense as uh, light sends, is sent out from a, from a mobile phone. It also sends out radiation. You cannot say the mobile phone is only the thing you have in your pocket because the mobile phone is present uh, more or less all over the universe a few minutes after you turn it on. Huh? So it's 100 milliseconds on the other side of Earth, uh, eight minutes on the surface of the sun. So it's a very non-local phenomenon. Same thing with the radiation from your conscious choices. Karma means what? It means action, intentional action. So karma is not the result of action. Usually Western thinks that. That's called vipaka, which means result, or falla, which means fruit. So karma is, strictly speaking, the intention you have when you do an action. Uh, so there's two kinds of karma, detrimental karma and advantageous karma. What is the difference? The difference is that if there is present in this intention 
shades of or mixtures of or full-fledged either hate, greed or ignorance. Then the karma is disadvantageous. What does it mean is disadvantageous? This means that the, when the result falls out much later down the road, then the, the result will be painful. There will be, there will be lack of success. There will be all kinds of things that uh, is unpleasant. While if uh, the intention behind the action, behind the thinking, behind the speech, behind the doing with the physical body is good, that is to say, is not mixed with hate, is not mixed with ignorance, is not mixed with any kind of greed, lust, then uh, the, the, the populistic wave will later result in pleasure and happiness and also success. So it will lift up the, the, the individual. In all cases, also for Buddhists and also for monks and also for you, the most what we do is uh, neither detrimental nor, nor advantageous. It's neutral karma, you can say. And so, uh, and then also it's mixed up with both good and bad. And that's just typical of ending on the human situation. Uh, if we just take very shortly, the Buddhist co cosmology of beings is that there are 31 levels of existence, of conscious existence, and humans are level five. <laughs> so fairly modest. Uh, we are not uh, the biggest in the universe, <laughs> neither are we the first, uh, nor are we any kind of uh, the peak of uh, Darwinistic uh, evolution. We are on a, we say it's a happy state. Why is a happy state? Because we experience so much uh, frustration, or a mixture of frustration, happiness, and satisfaction to the extent that we want to make it better. If you have an, you know, extreme luxury uh, that, like the devas have, uh, they don't see their body decay, for example, they don't become older. They are, they are looking 17 year old when you, they come into spontaneous uh, existence and the only thing they can see is billions years after or uh, millions years after they will see that they sit on a seat like this, usually with the leg uh, drawn up like this, so they have one leg stretched and then one leg like this. Then they will see that the flowers start uh, climpsing, they will have sweat under their arms the, the clothes will start wrinkling, and they do not feel pleasure in sitting in the in the special seat, which is called a vinmana. And so they can move this around with this uh, uh, to a various extent. The, a deva world or a deva dimension can be like this, not larger than this. This will be reckoned small. Uh, so here, one male or uh, a lot of females devas will devatas will be present, and this can then this pub, this deva can move this around freely in space. So he doesn't need to, or she doesn't need to go down from, from where she sits. This is the, usually the case. So when they feel dissatisfied with sitting there, and they see these other signs, uh, but no, any, no physical degradation, then the other devas know, ah, now it's time for this one. And then they will go to a special stone, in the case of lower devas, they will go to a special park where there's a yellow stone, they will lie on the yellow stone, then the other devas will pass on and uh, uh, throw flowers on the, the individual, and then they will say, a special saying, that go down to the human states, do good and come back to us. Uh, and then they will kind of evaporate. They don't have any uh, physical date as, as the same as us. I think this, uh, I can say, just say also this about this, is, is divided in three. So uh, there's 31 levels, up to 11, 11, 11. Uh, and Jehovah and the, what we in Christianity call Satan, he resides on the level uh, 11. There they have this funny relation that they don't have any pleasure of doing anything themselves. They, they have a power over other people's creations. That is power over their verbal creations, their mental creations, and their physical creations. And they, so they have kind of like a gaming experience. You don't know if you played any social uh, computer games where you're kind of like uh, directing around an army or something they, uh, to build up something. It's, they have a, a bit something like that experience. Uh, so they don't feel pleasure by doing anything themselves. They feel pleasure if they can get somebody else to do it. And uh, since they can enter our minds, both collectively and uh, like an open door in most cases, if we are unaware of it, then they have a fairly good chance of remoting of, uh, uh, around on, the, on this field. And they do, uh, to, to, for various purposes. One of them is very evil. He's a kind of like a terrorist on his level, but they are not always very evil. Uh, the king on this level, he's, uh, he's fairly good, but uh, this terrorist, uh, he cannot handle. He's, uh, he's, we call him Mara, the evil one. The other epithet of him is uh, 
Namuchi, which means the one who doesn't give any escape to anyone. Uh, if you meet him personally and you recognize that he's there, uh, then uh, two reaction, emotional reaction is common. One is you feel like your spine becomes ice if he's close. The other one is you feel like you are shitting in your trousers from fear, basically. Uh, his personality, he's uh, frighteningly intelligent, very, very fast, but also uh, extremely psychopathic. And he's called the evil one, not without reason. But however, he is also, he is also a, a sentient being. He will also one day see, he has a political purpose with this. He's a, a hyper hedonist. His, his political statements, number one, is that uh, sensual pleasure, what you can see, hear, taste, touch, uh, and think, uh, a mental state you can have under the intoxication, that's the highest happiness. And this he wants to enforce on all beings. For, for, for any price, for any price, whatever, whatever it costs, including for himself, he wants to enforce this uh, hedonistic worldview. And this he does, and this he does. It's kind of an office because there will always be one. Most Western people are hedonists to some extent. Huh? Uh, basically, this was the advertisement is about, and uh, consumerism is about. However, he's to an extreme degree, and he's a political about it, he's fanatic about it. Uh, so he's not, uh, he's, he's, not in a, he, he's not my friend, you can say. I'm friend with him, but he, does, he doesn't like Buddhist monks, basically because we are spoiling his uh, social game. We are antagonists. He, he feels we are political antagonists. <laughs> Enough about uh, him. Ah, I would say his personality, uh, when you meet him uh, up close per, on a personal level, uh, I can only f uh, see one, and that's uh, the character in Batman, uh, the Joker. The Joker, he's very close to that. Uh, but I'll say just Joker times, ten times more joking than the Joker. More, 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 yeah, more scary, more wicked. Uh, he, in many times he, he will try to play the good one, and you don't see the Joker do that that often. So he will try to uh, kind of like tempt you <laughs> with uh, simulating being somebody else, and he's very skilled at that. Very skilled at that. So usually you're fooled. Usually you're fooled. Anyway, uh, I, I can also say. Uh, so the, there, they are. This called karma loka. Why so? Because they are driven like we are towards pleasure, sense pleasure, and that's dri driving. This is driving pressure of all the sentient beings in this karma loka. Then there's brahma loka. They're, they're the meditators. They're made in another material called fine material. They will typically not interact with our material. One deva comes and speaks, Brahman deva comes and speaks with the Buddha at night, and then suddenly he, he's grabbed into pain. I sink, I sink, he says. So it's kind of like sinking into the earth. And then the Buddha says, you have to make yourself into gross matter, gross matter, which is the matter we are made out of, electron, protons, and so on, which is much more heavy. The Brahma Deva has some correlation to modern cosmology because, as you, you might know, there's something called dark matter. And if you take, it should be something like 80% of the mass that is in the universe. This means all this and all planets, uh, all things we can see, including gases, this is only 4 or 5% of what we know is the mass out there. And just when I was making this, uh, this, uh, this speech, uh, a new finding of a whole galaxy at the size, uh, at the same weight as the Milky Way galaxy. So it has the same weight as the galaxy we're living in. And it's made out of 99.999% dark matter. So it doesn't take much fantasy to say, if you have a whole, uh, you have a whole galaxy with 10,000 of suns, this are, in our galaxy, there's 10,000 of suns who have planets circling around them with fluid water and carbon life. Same thing in this dark matter uh, universe. It doesn't take much fantasy to say, and then there has to be beings which are made out of this dark matter. And this would basically, from a Buddhist point of view, we say this is a Brahma Loka. Brahma Loka, which is described to be very far, but not uh, immediately uh, recognizable from the text. There's some, the Buddha say there's some uh, world system. We're living in one world system. The word for world system is also called Chakravala. And Chakravala means world wheel. And uh, actually, if you look at a galaxy, if at least if it's a, it's a planar galaxy, then you have this uh, black hole in the middle, and then the centrum, and then you have these arms. So it looks a bit like a wheel. So this is my interp current interpretation. I'm not sure that it's correct, but it could be that the world wheel uh, is, 
actually the meaning in our language is, is a galaxy. I think so, at least. Okay, uh, we go straight to the philosophy. It's based on uh, four tenets, you can say, or three tenets maybe. First is based on causality. The causality is what? Causality is uh, assumption or framework or conceptual thinking that if there is a cause, then there are also one or several effects. And vice versa, if you have an effect, then you have one or multiple causes. So causality is that this one makes this one comes into being. The Buddha, he said like this, uh, explain this paticca samuppada, dependent co-arising like this. When this arise, when this cause arise, this effect also arise. When this cause cease, this effect also cease. When this cause is present, that effect also is present. When this cause is absent, that effect also is absent. So this is causality in four lines. This is only one relation out of 24 conditional relations described in the Patana, which is the last the seven books we have is describing these 24 conditional relations. This, this we will call sahayati. They are born together. They come up and go together. But it could also be if you have the, the vice versa relation is to say when the cause come up, then the, the effect disappears. Mm -hmm. so, so there are actually 24 of these conditional relations between cause and effect. This is basically Western science. All Western science is based on the same assumption that first you have a cause and then you have an effect. You cannot have retrocausality that uh, effects that, uh, or causes that are in the future, they af affect retrocausal into the past. So this is basically an order in time that first you have to cause, then you, have to, you get the effect. One or more effects. Huh? This seems to be, uh, when you look both at quantum mechanics and also when you look at it from a Buddhist point of view, uh, space-time doesn't seem really to be a fact that is out there. It might be, as Einstein put it, the order or the sequence of our experiences. So we put, we have experiences, uh, and then we put them into order. And this order we then call space-time. So it can be something that a consciousness, uh, I will not call it an illusion, but uh, space-time is not what we usually think it is. But even in relativity it is not what we think it is. There we will say that Space is uh, a one big block that doesn't change, but actually what Einstein found out is that when you drive in your car and you pass a bridge, then the bridge becomes shorter. And the quicker you, you drive, the shorter it becomes. And if you try to measure the time in the bridge, then it goes slower. And this is a fact, so it relates to you as an observer. So there's no space and time out there independent of the observer. And the Buddha say the exact same thing. So there's it always has to be coupled to the observer. So that there's a, it's an illusion, which we call naive local realism, that there is a world out there that is independent of the observing mind. Quantum mechanics take it one more step further. It's say uh, there's no phenomena, no elementary particle, no electron, no proton, no neutron, that is, uh, has any characteristics before it's observed. So it's the observation itself that gives this cloud, this probability cloud, or quantum of energy, a specific characteristic, that is, to, that it have a speci specific location. Uh, and the Buddha says exactly the same. So it's, an, it's to some extent an illusion that we think that we can observe the world and then get that the world exists there independently of the observer. So both the Buddha and the quantum mechanics say that there are two tenets that uh, breaks down. One is uh, is locality, and the other one is reality. Locality will say that there's no thing that can go to space and then affect something that if there's not any signal going or if there's not any causal chain. But that has been proven actually to be wrong, because there's some experiments, twin photon experiments, where you can take a, a photon that has gone into a crystal, based on board crystal, then you have two photons here. And if you change the spin, the, the the spinner, one of them, the spinner said, if the spin is anti-clockwise, then they say the spin is down. And if you say the spin is clockwise, then you say the spin is up. And if you change this spin on one of them, then the other spin also change. And it changed instantaneously. And in principle, you can take these two photons and put one in one end of the universe and one in the other end of the universe. And if you change the spin, 
then they all change at the same time. So they are coupled. They are still one quantum state. So this means that they, it's kind of like a football. They, they don't experience as if they were separated in space. And that's why this space seems to be, uh, I'm not saying illusion, but something else. When you try to build these two theories, very strange theories together, then uh, you get something called quantum gravity. One particular uh, brand or um, you can say kind of quantum gravity is called corsets. And this will basically say this causal sets. And it says that uh, uh, space-time is not something else, it's just a sequence of order we put into our experiences or into our observances, observations. And then one more thing, the number, the volume of the space-time. And the volume comes directly if you say, if you put into an assumption directly that space-time is discrete. That is to say that we're living on a framework it's not a continuous space. It's living like we're living on a gita or a matrix where you can exist on the, uh, on, the, on the framework, but you cannot exist in between. Why not? Because there's no space there. Space is itself discrete. It's called the Planck length. Uh, it's fairly large, but uh, uh, compared to uh, microscopic uh, details, but nevertheless, uh, if you have this, then you, you can just say, I have one Planck length and one Planck length and one, then you have a small cubus. Then you only have to count, and then you get the volume. So the only thing you make to make, to make space-time in relativistic sense is to have a, an order of sequence, that is to say a description of course, an effect, and then a number for the volume. And this proves to be very close, closely related to what the Buddha say, is that the space-time is not an illusion, but it's something else that we say. It's conditional relations between cause and effect, and nothing else than that. I find that interesting, that the two worldviews, which is very far from our worldview, I'll just say that realism also is broken, is to say, uh, you will expect that these uh, objects that we see, they are there before they are observed. They are also there after they are observed. This is what say, ah, no, no, now you are, you are ascribing to a wrong view called eternalism. Uh, but quantum mechanics will say the same. It's only when you observe the object that it actually has these properties. Before it's observed, it's a cloud of probability. Bohr, will, from this, who is born here, he will say, if you have an electron, for example, and uh, you try to measure only the, the position in x-axis, and then you measure it many times, then you get the frequency that it look like that. So sometimes it's out here, a few times out here, and then it's mostly in the middle. So you have a frequency, if you, if you calculate it, then you, you get a probability distribution. So uh, before uh, or after the measurement, you cannot say really where this electron is. It has no definite position. So this means that locality is broken. You cannot point out a specific place it is. Bohr will then say, what's the state of the electron, this quantum energy, which you are made out of? What's the state, what's the ontological state of it? He will say it's in, an, in a superposition of states that it has, we have to say, it has all positions at the same time. And this, uh, this uh, superposition of states, you can easily take and make an experiment where, where a photon, for example, comes into an apparatus and then it can go, go up, there's a beam splitter, and then it goes this way, and its separation is, can be half a meter, it can be several meters. And then uh, you have to conclude, at the end of the experiment, that it is in both paths. It is both, both paths at the same time, when it is in a superposition, in a superposition state. So uh, there you have a breakdown of locality that you can put your hand in between a photon, which is a very, very tiny massless object, that it is both in the upper path and it is also in the lower path, when unobserved. If you observe it, you will always find it in one path. So it's the observation itself that makes it have a definite position. So it's not, you cannot say that it has a definite position before the observation or after the, 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 the observation. There you can say it is a, in a superposition of all possible locations. In this case, where there's only two paths, then it can be only, it can be, it's in a superposition of being the upper path and in the lower path. But that's a logical breakdown because it's a small billiard ball, right? Huh? So it cannot be both places, but that nevertheless is what we have to accept. And the Buddha say the same thing. So it's observation itself. When you speak about the world, you, s you say, uh, you probably uh, ascribe to that, that it's independent, you can make an independent obs observation of the world, but that's, that's, that's an impossibility. 
justice that we say that it's a world and uh, that you, you if I ask you to witness how you say that it's a world I, I see it or I hear it or I taste it then you then obviously it is an experience of the world so the world is an experience physical or mental what do you say what do you say Laos Perception. It's a perception. Is it a perception, uh, mental or physical? It, is, it can be both, actually, mm -hmm. because uh, the past is more linked to the physical and, and the future is more linked to the mental, I would say. You can say it has physical aspects that uh, there's something going on in the brain, but the experience itself, for example, you see yellow over there, is definitely mental. Huh? It's def so it's a, an experience is a mental thing, but it's a we will ascribe it to a physical world. And this is Buddha will say also, there is Dhamma, and this basically means mental states. Uh, enough about quantum mechanics and relativity. Let's go into more, how, well, how is the timing? You don't know. I don't know either. Nevertheless, uh, okay, fine. <laughs> I had carte blanche to all night. Uh, there's three signs, universal signs, that the Buddhists, all the Buddhists say, basically characterize the world and that is one impermanence so uh, this to be this easy to see the most easy is called anicca nicca means permanence anicca impermanence mm -hmm. so everything changes you're becoming older you're not a baby anymore one day you become old same thing with the world same thing with very uh, semi-static uh, objects like mountains they evaporate they also vibrate if you go down in scale so uh, that's impermanence that's change this cannot be, re this, uh, there's a change, in, there's a flux uh, that you cannot keep anything basically. Uh, that you will, uh, this also implies that you will lose anything, including the pleasure you are feeling of in any moment. This is the first characteristic. This then leads to the natural uh, conclusion that everything uh, out there and in here is basically suffering. Because if you feel pleasure in it, then uh, the more pleasure you feel, and you, you can say, yeah, if you have a moment of pleasure with contact with a given object, then uh, while the pleasure is going up, you feel very agreeable feeling, you accept it very much. While the pleasure is uh, on a high but level point, it's still agreeable, it's still something that you accept. But as soon as the pleasure starts going down in intensity, then uh, it feels as some kind of frustration, which is uh, becoming increasing when it goes back to zero. So you can say, uh, already here on the shelf of uh, the going down of the pleasure, uh, it's, feel, it's felt as frustration even though uh, the pleasure level actually is higher than, than the beginning. So it's only on the rise or on the plateau. Actually, you can say on the, the, the limb of the plateau size, it can be felt as boredom. You have a certain kind of pleasure, but then it doesn't change and then it's kind of like seeps into boredom if you're not aware. If you're aware of it, then you can see it rise and cease without being either attached to it when it goes up or uh, uh, clinging to it when it goes down. But nevertheless, uh, another factor can say uh, the more you fall in love with the object when it comes, f think of a lover, for example, or your dish, or a new job, or a new social status, or um, a new life maybe, the more you, uh, you feel pleasure about it or delights in it, takes delight in it, the more you have to pay on, on the backside. So it's a catch-22. If it's a small bump, ah, well, you, you, you just feel a little tickle and then it's over, but nevertheless, huh? But if it's a big, 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 big life story, romance, holy bananas, huh? Uh, then uh, you have to go to a psychologist, of three, <laughs> afterwards, huh? Uh, and this, of course, is uh, very banal. The last one is difficult. Is, uh, the, the argument goes like this. If there is something that is impermanent and it's also suffering, how can it then be a self? So this means that uh, the argument goes here, if there was a self, if you were in control, if, or if the self was in control of itself, then it would be able, it would have autonomy to make itself happy. But since, obviously, you cannot, if you're unhappy, make yourself happy just like that. Huh? You have to go to the psychologist or whatever, uh, or take the happy pill, or uh, seek advice, or uh, drink a beer. Or so the self apparently is not in control of itself. 
It cannot make itself happy. It cannot say if you prick your finger with a needle, then it cannot say, I'll let the pain stop. So this, this jumps up the question then, if the self is not in control of itself, is it then a self? Or who is in control if the self is not in control of itself? So therefore you can see that this, this uh, hypothetical self that we think, if it's not in autonomy, can it then really be a self? And if, if something else is, in autonomy, is having this power uh, to give you pain and pleasure, then would it not be more fitting to whatever that is to call that a self? And that's basically circumstances that are usually impersonal. Think of a lover who leaves. Is that then yourself? Or the needle in the finger, is that then yourself? These are obviously things that we don't call self. So this is the first argument. Uh, this is uh, the argument of autonomy. Then the second thing is uh, the argument of impermanence. Even in, in, the, in the conception of self, is the following assumption, that I am the same. You should also say to that, uh, you have the same name, but that's actually only a label. It doesn't say anything that within the box. Uh, imagine yourself as a baby. You're obviously physical, completely different from what you are now. And the same thing with the old person you are de developing in 20 years. Huh? So nothing, no molecule in you will be the same in uh, four or five years. Huh? So physically speaking, you are not the same. You're breathing out, you're producing urine, uh, you're breathing carbon dioxide out, you're, you're breathing, taking in, in, you're losing water from the surface of your skin. So in a physical, purely atomic sense, uh, you are evaporating and exchanging, you are not the self. If, I take, if you take something to drink, uh, can I borrow this for a minute? Yes. Then you will say, uh, typically, now there's, we could say that there was something in it. Now, when it's outside me, this is not myself. Huh? Then, then just by drinking it, suddenly you assign self to this whatever is down there. It goes into my stomach, it d diffuses into the body. Then you call this the self. And then when you go out, peed out in the, in the toilet, ah, there myself goes down the pod, ah, come back, bye bye. Huh? This you should do, but obviously you don't, you don't. Huh? So you have a very, I can say, uh, quasi stationary idea about what this self is. Sometimes it's not self, and then uh, suddenly it becomes self, and then suddenly it becomes not self again. Uh, so, so there's something, uh, something quirky going on, a very inconsistent definition of what self is. Same thing with the, uh, if we take the mental part, this is usually what people identify with, but also in some, to some extent also the body. So you say, ah, what is myself? Is, can it be my consciousness? But consciousness is changing all the time. If I look out, if I open my eyes, close my eyes, now I know visual consciousness, now I have. You have auditory consciousness. Uh, you have mental consciousness trying to understand it. what this man is saying, that there is no self. It's absurd. Of course there is a self. Uh, but uh, actually there is not. You can say, uh, you are more, now you're laughing, but uh, you are more different from yourself from one moment to the next, mentally speaking. Just imagine the laughing, the laughing person, uh, the smiling person, and the angry person. These two persons are, if you should characterize their mental characteristics, then are from one moment to the next moment completely different, more different than you are. Uh, the difference between uh, now that you say you're that different individuals, huh? you are intent, you're listening, and so on. So you are more on level. But if one person is crying here and another one is smiling here, then if this is the same person that can have these two very different characteristics, how can it be the same person? Huh? So everything that you will say, we will say a person is what the person is, is not the same, is not another. It's a form, don't call it a body, but it's a form, it's a feeling, it's a perception, it's mental construction and consciousness. So let's say we put down this in a box, and then we put the name on the box. All these five things are momentary. They change from one second to the next. They actually change with, from one plank moment to the next. So uh, it's a conception of the person, or personality, or individuality, where you have something coming into the box and going out to the box incessantly, but the label on the box is the same, but not more than that. So there is individuality, but there's no identity. Why not? Because nothing, every time you look down in this box, nothing is the same. So if there's no, there's, there's no, no thing that is identical with itself from one moment to the next moment, neither in the physical sense nor in the mental sense, how can it be an identity? Huh? It cannot be. 
it, it, uh, there has to be something down in this box that is identical from one moment to the next moment if it should be fair to deposit a self there and say, ah, this is me, this is me, this is what I am, this, this, I am made of this, oh, I own this. But there's nothing down in this box that doesn't change. This is the argument of impermanence. So you're not in control and there's nothing in the same. So where's yourself, huh? Can you show it to me? <laughs> the Greek had an idea that there was a small man in the big man, called a homunculus, a small man, kind of like a small uh, man sitting, uh, steering a robot. Huh? But if, obviously, if you cut up the body, there's no, you cannot find any robot. And the and, uh, uh, last thing I would say about it from a subjective point of view, when you give up this idea of a self, you, you, of course, pride. Pride is not a problem. Arrogance is not a problem. You don't have to defend anything. Uh, you don't have to uh, dream of putting this self in some kind of position, either socially, economically, uh, bodily, or in any kind of, because there is no self. There's something else. Uh, and this is something that is uh, coming around and fluxing and you have to bend it and so on. But it's not you. It's not what you are. It's not what you own. So this, this identification is a release. It's a release. It is, uh, the Buddha say that uh, harmlessness towards all sentient beings, that is bliss. A larger degree of bliss is that you have no craving for sensual pleasures. You have no craving for seeing anything, hearing anything, touching, tasting, anything. But the largest bliss is this release from this abysmal self-deception that I am, I exist. And this is, uh, and this is uh, really true, really true. It comes in two, uh, actually in two steps. It comes first, uh, uh, for example, I'm not ascribed to, when I point at this uh, frame, that this is my, this is me, this is mine, this is what I am. I will conventionally say, ah, yes, uh, this is a body. Uh, we can say it's my body, but I don't own it. For example, I cannot take it with me after death. I cannot even say, I have no control, I cannot even say that I shouldn't uh, become sick. I cannot say that I shouldn't become old. So I have partial control over this uh, frame, this construction, but I don't identify with it. And the same thing also with feelings, perceptions, mental constructions, which is notably is something like hopes, intentions, plannings, uh, that you project in the future. This self is doing this and that, experiencing this and that, and you're trying to gaming your way through uh, to get more happiness for this uh, imaginary self. This, uh, this uh, I don't do, I don't do. Uh, so there is some release, we call it that, uh, this false view that this is my, myself, this is what I am, this is what I'm made of, this I own, or this I own, this is what I am, this consciousness itself, for example. To release that is to say, now I no, have no Sakaya Diti. Sakaya Diti means that you believe that this group of phenomena, your body, your mental perceptions, your experiences, your feelings, and your consciousness, consciousness is difficult that this is yourself, or either one of them is yourself, or they collectively, by some trick, they uh, make up yourself. That you can find an ego that's uh, the same inside this group of phenomena, that's the same tomorrow, was the same when you were born, and will be the same when you die. But this one cannot find, this one cannot find. And I think you can, if you observe yourself just through this talk, and from tomorrow, you will have difficulty with pointing something out inside yourself, or outside yourself, that is the same. Uh, from this moment to tomorrow, for example, or from this moment to three seconds down the road. Huh? Anyone who have a shot at it? I'm, I'm curious if you can say that you or I have some kind of characteristics. Yes. Uh, uh, yes, you have characteristics, but uh, let's say memories, for example. Why are memories not the same? You have a subjective feeling that the memories of your childhood uh, is the same. But uh, this, in this particular case, I had studied myself. And the funny thing is that if you try to remember these things, then it's like playing a, a similar film, but it's not the same film. So if you try to remember your memories, uh, any kind, you, you remember something different every time. So even that is different. So it's like a, a, the same film played by other actors. So you don't, you don't have photographic memory, so if you play a memory from your childhood or from something you did 10 years ago or even uh, yesterday, you will note that there's differences. 
there's differences in the in, but there is some you can say traits uh, that is dragging along this is tendencies to be uh, for example to be greedy if you were greedy in the last existence you would also be born greedy in this same thing if you have aversion or irritation opposition as a main defilement you will also be reborn with that but even that is uh, is not permanent it's not uh, locked down if it were locked down then uh, to gain mental purity and to go scot-free, what would be impossible. Huh? So if you were the same personality from life to life, you could not go scot-free, you could not attain Nibbana. You would be locked in this particular uh, personality, as I, I guess you, you will call it, huh? that you feel is me, which is some kind of indefinable summation of past memories, tendencies, uh, various other characteristics, tendencies to like this, dislike that, and so on. So they are drifting through with you for time, but you can change it, especially if one becomes aware of it. Mm-hmm. Other questions about this no self? If there's no self, what is uh, attaining enlightenment? Yes, a very good question. It's a classical one. It's a classical one. Uh, well, in uh, 250 years before Christ, there was uh, a big emperor, and he had a general with him called Mineta from the Greek. Uh, Melinda, his called. He asked the same question: What is attaining enlightenment? We'll say that the, uh, it's an individuality as long as it feels it's an individuality. Let's say we let's take the picture of a river. It's also a process. So instead of you seeing yourself as an entity, as a fixed entity, then you can more accurately, because of this change, be described as some processes. They are dynamic all the time, huh? so they're changing all the time, just like a river is drifting by. What is the river? We give the name. We give it the same name. The river Ganges, for example. Is it the name? No. Is it? That's just a name. That's just a label. Is it then the, the size of the river? No. It's not the size. The river is actually the, this floating uh, stream of uh, water molecules down the down the lane. Huh? That's the river itself. Same thing with you. You have a stream of consciousness. You have a stream of feeling. You have a stream of perceptions. You have a stream of intending, hoping, and so on. So, from a Buddhist point of view, there's nothing that is static in Buddhism. Everything is processes. Everything is dynamic, because of this uh, noting this impermanent, this universal characteristics of impermanence. So you have something that is uh, drifting down. Uh, if you compare, let's just say take consciousness, and say that it's drifting down. What happens to the river Ganges? It floats out in the in the ocean. Then we cannot. It's even though it's the same molecules, they are mixing up with the same uh, with this Indian Ocean. You cannot uh, designate where it is. It's kind of like mixing in with all the other things. Then you just call it ocean. So right at the edge of the ocean, Ganges loses its, loses its, its names, but not its essence. It's the water is the same before and after, but it loses its name. And this you can also say is uh, what happens to the stream of consciousness that uh, goes into Nirvana, it loses its individuality. But it doesn't lose any identity. Why not? Because there was no identity in the first place. You cannot lose a self that is non-existent, of course. Huh? A banker, I told about this, he became in panic. Uh, he told it to his, uh, his, uh, his uh, pigs, uh, fo- folks at the bank. And then uh, he, he thought he was disappearing, actually. He, he felt kind of like existentialistic nausea. He was kind of like vomiting because he, he thought he was disappearing. And then I told him, told him don't, be, don't be afraid because you cannot lose something that you don't have. And so it's basically an idea about yourself. And as long as you are uh, in framing yourself, your own consciousness, your own stream of being in this frame, then you have some invisible bars, a prisons, you can say, that defines yourself, but thereby also restricts yourself to be with inside this process. And this r- r- small restricted self, they go around and tell s- stories about the other self. Ah, he and she is like this and that and blah, 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 up and down the doorway. So it's kind of like this self sits in the middle. It's, 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 uh, it's the core of egoism, you can say. Egoism is not the behavior, it's, just, it's the idea that there is a self, that there is an ego that there has a self. So, so the path exists up to Nirvana, but no one is seen walking it. Huh? So that, that was so. You, what you say is a, is a process entering, but there was no one there in the first place. Huh? So how can an identity that was not there enter, go from this state to that state? It's impossible. But it's not nihilism, is it? No, it's not nihilism. Nihilism has nothing yes, to do. There must be some uh, awareness that is 
Yes, yes. You can say, let's take another example. What did he say? If you take consciousness again, because this, is, I think, is most easy. He says uh, consciousness is papasara. Papasara means two things at the same time. It, it, sh it lights up on everything. So it's more, it's, it can show everything. It ma can manifest everything. So it's like in this lamp is uh, lighting on all of us. At the same time, he says, it is lighting up from everywhere. So it's not like it has a centrum that is beaming out from a particular place. It comes from everywhere and shines on everything and sees everything at the same time. So you can say it's a bit like particle wave duality of physics, that the ego consciousness is a consciousness that has restricted it into having a particular perspective. So now I see you in this perspective and you in this perspective. However, if the Buddha is right, then the innate consciousness will see you and you and the whole planet and all the, all the other galaxy at the same time. So uh, this said that the, that the particle aspect or the ego aspect of consciousness is kind of like restricted. It's probably a process that this stream of individuality infers or conduces to the to the consciousness. Just as we, when we look at this. Uh, this uh, light, this wave of light, then we observe it, then if we want to see something local, then it becomes a particle, then it's a photon. It's just a small dot, it has specific location. While we, if we don't want to uh, induce local aspects on it, then it's a wave. And a wave is non-local, it's basically everywhere at the same time. So there's nothing, uh, you can say metaphysical in it, it's a process of observation and inherent and often unconscious wanting to see something specific that make the reality, whether internal or external, react in such a way that you come to see something, either local or non-local, according to your wishes, according to your desire, according to your expectations, according to your prior experiences. So you don't look for something you don't know. You look for something that you have been, you have been looking for before and that you know it is in existence. Patterns, f colors, shapes. So you enforce on these superpositions of energy to uh, 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 be in this uh, particular existence form to the extent they can. Huh? So uh, you come with a probability distribution which is colored by your karmic past and then nature comes with a probability distribution which is basically physical, what is possible physically, and then these two are superimposed. And out of that comes some uh, highest probability, if this is 10, this is 20, 30, 40 percent, this is in 100 percent. Let's just say there's only four outcomes. Out of this superposition will fall most of these experiences that are in the high, high degrees. Huh? So it's, it's, I don't see it's kind of like a, a, this uh, interplay between uh, individual and non-individual is the same for the physical world as it is for the conscious world. I hope this answers your question. Yes, thank you. Okay. You had one also? Uh, I think it was answered by your last comment. Okay, thank, thank you. Thank you. Uh, maybe we should uh, start to meditate a little bit, huh? We can take just this last thing, it's the core of all Buddhism, it's the Four Noble Truths. Basically, you and I am here because we have been ignorant about these Four Noble Truths. Ignorance in Buddhism is specifically defined by not knowing the Four Noble Truths. Uh, what is the Four Noble Truths? The first Noble Truth is this, or thus, is suffering. Suffering in Pali is called Dukkha, means a bad state. Why is it a bad state? Because it's impermanent and you cannot control it, and thereby you will always lose it, and thereby it becomes suffering. The second uh, Noble Truth says, what's the cause of suffering? craving, tanna, thirst. Thirst for seeing something, hearing something, touching something, tasting something, smelling something, thinking something, being in particular mental states like orgasm or intoxicated mental states. It's craving for becoming, craving for becoming rich, respected, uh, famous, praised, uh, on a high social position and so on. And craving for not becoming, vibana tanna, craving for not becoming old, sick, uh, disrespected, uh, insignificant, the opposite of fame, uh, disregarded, and so on. Not becoming stupid, uh, not becoming ugly, not becoming smelly. So this desire is craving suffering. It's not the states themselves. For example, if you want to have uh, sex or some object, 
is not the object in itself, it's not a property of the object that makes it suffering. That's important to understand. The world is not suffering. It's the craving for the world that is suffering. Fame, uh, praise, richness is not suffering. There's nothing odious or evil or bad about these states in itself. It's the craving for them that creates the suffering. It's kind of like, ah, uh, yes? It's just what, what do you do or what should you do if you get a craving? What should you do? Ideally. Yeah, ideally. Then you should, uh, from my point of view, or from a Buddhist point of view, you should see, ah, now there's craving coming up, but it's, it's, you have to be hyper aware. Huh? So you should see the craving coming up. So you should recognize, uh, is this something that is advantageous or disadvantageous? And obviously, craving, because there's some greed there, there's some attraction there, huh? then uh, it's disadvantageous. And uh, then right there, the, it will cool down to 50%. Uh, so say, do I really need this chocolate? Do I really need this new car? Do I really need this new lover? Do I really need this uh, social status? And then you relinquish it half the way. There can be some necessary, for example, I also feed, uh, I take food, huh? uh, but this is to sustain this body, to finish the job. Uh, so uh, craving uh, will be, you say, there's some necessary some to, to, be, to be in existence to finish the job, but otherwise, Cravings will uh, unambiguously, you can say, cause suffering, even if it's satisfied. Let's say, you, for example, you take your, your, your favorite dish a uh, hundred times, you have craving for it, and then you eat, for example, chocolate, nougat, for example. Huh? You eat uh, nougat uh, first time, and you say, ah, delicious, delicious French nougat. And then you eat it second time, and third time, and twelfth times, and fourteenth time, then it start to be a little boring. Because you're not aware of it, huh? you're not aware of this craving coming. So you're just an autopilot. Then number 52 times you take nougat, then it's very boring. And uh, number two, then they, 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 they force feed you with nougat, and it's a nougat prison. And then uh, the 12,000 times they come with this block of nougat, then you say, no, 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 no. Even though, notice this, the object, the nougat, is exactly the same. So the feeling that you have pleasure with it when it's not known, and you feel bottom with it in the middle, and you feel extreme disgust with it in the end. It has apparently nothing to do with the nougat itself. It has nothing to do. Usually we'll say, ah, money or pancake, the pleasure by them as at, is a characteristic of the object itself. No, it is not a characteristic. It is something that mind interprets. Either it wants it, then it ascribes pleasure to it. If it doesn't want it, it feels disgusted, then it feels humongous frustration by being shocked uh, or force feed with this uh, 12 tons of nougat. Yeah? And what about the craving for enlightenment? Yes. Is that also so yes, yes. <laughs> very good question also. Also a classic. Huh? Actually, that I was... Uh, suffering. Yes, it very much. I'm, I'm suffering from it daily, basically. <laughs> uh, no, you can say, uh, actually my son uh, asked me this question, I was dissing up, this was shortly before I was uh, going forth, and then he, he sat on a chair, I think he was uh, close to seven, and then he asked exactly the same question. And then uh, the answer is, uh, goes like this, yes, it's true, definitely, definitely, it is a kind of craving, and definitely, because of all cravings, I have craving that I'm not enlightened. I used 15 years of my life, and I, I did as, 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 as good as I can. I could have done better, I realized that, but nevertheless, uh, I'm, I'm not enlightened. Uh, so obviously, I didn't finish the job. So that's very frustrating. Uh, and I asked myself, what to do next? What should I, what should I improve on? Huh? How, how can I come closer? Uh, I'm not crying about it, but I feel uh, significant, at times, feel significant frustration about it. However, it will be so for me and also for you. Imagine a person who has a craving for uh, walking up a mountain. Let's say Mount Everest. He has this craving. He walks up the mountain. I'm on, on my mo mountain. Huh? You're on your mountain. He walks up this mountain. Uh, this craving he has to reach the top. It disappears right at the moment he sets feet there. Huh? Because now he is where he, he wants to be. So this also will happen in my enlightenment. And this also will happen in your enlightenment moment that you will, this craving to attain this state will disappear, will disappear. So uh, this will say there's two uh, kinds of desire, two kinds of cravings, uh, two kinds of urge. One is the urge for enlightenment, which is advantageous because it leads to freedom. It leads to freedom, it sets you free. 
while the other one, the usual craving for sensuality, it leads to bondage. Huh? Because you, it's addictive. Huh? It's addictive. You basically, you are here in a human state because you like nougat, you like sex, drugs, rock and roll. And so do all the other sentient beings. Huh? That's why we are bossing around in Kama Loka. Then we boss around uh, like a spy fly in a, in a bottle. Huh? It goes down there because there's sugar on the, on the, on the bottom. There's pressure on the bottom. Huh? It boss around, becomes psychologists and doctors and all kinds of things down in this bottle. But nevertheless, the story is very short. Every time you look at the bottle sufficiently long, it lies down on the bottle, legs up. Then, okay, you find it in a new bottle. And it's equally, it's, very, it's like when you, you, you look at ants and you, you try to say, they're running around and it seems planless. It seems absurd, the thing they do. Of course, they can't make anthills and so on. So they must have something. But just looking at them from above, it seems absurd that they're just running around in complete disorder. However, if you scale up your own life and this group, and see our busting around in this bottle and that bottle. Isn't that not the same, basically? Huh? Yes? But why try so hard to be enlightened and be free if you are impermanent, if, if you're not... Ah, okay, okay. Uh, Nibbana is not, uh, it's not included in this world. It's not a place. It's a state. It has no spatial or temporal characteristics. It doesn't begin. It doesn't end. It doesn't have a cause. It's not an effect. It's not a fantasy. It's not a mental construction. It's ineffable. You cannot express it. Uh, you can say what it doesn't is, but the negative uh, statements is often a little boring. If I should express what I expect it to be, but this is only my private expectation, and we can try and meditate, then you will, you will have a, some kind of shadow or taste of it yourself. Then I would say, uh, it's, I, th I have to say three words. It's absolute freedom. It is complete peace, and it's the highest happiness. Yeah. And this stillness and this emptiness is something that is just there. Yeah. I wouldn't say the issue that is anything that is there. Uh, so uh, it's difficult to say. However, subjectively, people, when we talk about it intellectually, this emptiness or this no ego being present, this seems frightening or um, like a big vacuum. However, subjectively, you have to experience this for yourself. Subjectively, when we sit down and you empty your mind, if we are successful about it, if I can take you along, then uh, you will feel as soon as you, all these distractions of your mind, they are tickling down and uh, you have fewer and fewer objects in your mind, fewer and fewer thoughts. Then the subjective feeling of happiness and bliss, uh, in Danish, this increases. So there's no, apparently, when there's no sense objects, when there's no world basically, when there's no thinking about it, dreaming about it, longing back to it, or whatever, when there's nothing of all this, then you feel bliss, you feel peace. And so, so, and that's what you want in the first place. And that's, that's what I have a private idea. It's not Buddhism, but uh, it seems to me that since all consciousnesses have only one thing in mind, and that's to find lasting happiness. And that, that you can, if you, 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 you why are you, have you come here? So basically, huh? Why, why, why I have come here? Why do all beings do what they do? It is because if you get a, a moment of sense pleasure, a satisfaction, then the urge you always have scanning for next sense pleasure, this urge is uh, relinquished and uh, silenced for a short period of time. Then you experience peace because there's no urge, there's no scanning. And this peace, right in the tail of this peace comes this happiness. So there has to be peace first. You cannot have happiness without peace. And I mean here inner peace, not the physical absence of war and so on. So uh, this happiness is the purpose of all conscious life. So if this is uh, what we want, this is what consciousness want, it, maybe it comes from Nibbana and is, is kind of like trying to come home. It's, has got, it has got lost in samsara, in the time ocean of suffering. Huh? Because your, your, your database is half deleted every time you are reborn, then you kind of remember all this birth, and then you kind of like trick yourself into, now I'm a new being, and I can do whatever I like, and can plan my thing out of it, I can design my thing out of it, and uh, before you end up, before you think of it, you ended up like a dead spy fly in a new bottle. Huh? Then you wake up again, ah, 
New intoxication, new sex, drugs, and rock and roll. Yo, until a little later, two, 20 years later. Ah. So, yes, yes, what was it about? I can't remember. Maybe I should ask these monks or the psychologist. <laughs> <laughs> should we try to meditate? Ah, the f- so this is the noble truth. <laughs> the noble truth. So, craving, what's the cause of suffering? Craving, craving, tana. Logically, by inference, what's then the end of suffering is absence of craving. Absence of craving. No craving is the end of suffering. How to attain uh, no, no craving? That's then the job. The method is one we call the Noble Eightfold Way. It's right view, samadhiti, right motivation, right speech, right action, right livelihood, right effort, and right awareness, and right concentration. Uh, I think we, we go over time if I uh, explain this in detail. Uh, but I can just say that right motivation, for example, is uh, first harmlessness, that you are completely harmless to all beings, including yourself, non-cruelty, and then thirdly, importantly, withdrawal, nikkama. So instead of involving you and yourself in the world, you're pulling yourself out of it, pulling yourself out of it. And right awareness, we will uh, try to mix now with one of the objects uh, of meditation. Is there any question to this uh, philosopher uh, part? I just, I just yeah? So, uh, is, how can you say, for example, there's a Mandela's craving for peace in a way, is that good or bad? Uh, yes, you can say his craving for peace is, is, is a good one. However, would you say, would you expect uh, when Nelson Mandela inside this prison or even outside this prison was it, was he happy about having this, uh, this craving, or was he frustrated about this piece obviously not being present? Is it a question for me? Yes. I don't know. You don't know? No. Uh, I, I guess think he was happy in a way about uh, his, it, it was a good craving. I think uh, actually, uh, b- but uh, we ha- of course have to ask him himself. Mm-hmm. Since since it was not present, then I think Mandela was frustrated about it. Huh? And I think even the situation is today uh, in, in South Africa is so, so that he will, be, he will be frustrated about it. So I think he suffers from this craving also. But uh, it's a matter of conjecture, huh? we'll have to ask him. But you can say, the pe- again, it's not the peace. It's not the peace that determines the suffering, it's the craving. Huh? So you understand, it's, it's, not the, it's not the object that has inborn in it, the, neither the feeling uh, of pleasure or pain, nor that it's, it's suffering. It's the craving for it that determines that it's suffering. And thereby also, Nibbana is definitely not evil. It's definitely not bad. It's the highest happiness. Huh? It's complete freedom. However, as you pointed out, if you crave for it, you experience suffering. I experienced frustration with not succeeding. <coughs> and this also, I think, uh, Mandela did when he didn't succeed making peace, huh? obviously. He didn't get the job done. All beings are born and created by the Kamma. They are formed, shaped, conditioned, elevated, and restricted by the Kamma. These past actions, this past behavior, is the womb of probability from which they re-emerge. All beings are owners of their karma, debtors to their karma, and they inherit their karma. Whatever they do, whether good or bad, the later effects of that will be theirs only. This accumulation of probability follows them like a shadow of the past that never leaves. Therefore does this karma come to divide all beings into high and low, beautiful or ugly.